Aloha, welcome back to General Pharmacology. Let's move to the PowerPoint slides and get started today. Uh, today we're going to start section four, uh, and that opens up with endocrinology. Hey, endocrinology is a big subject, so we, we better get moving here. Oh, different keyboard, that's why. I'm like, wait a minute. All right, well, before we get too excited about the endocrine system, if you've ever taken a course about the endocrine system from anyone else, uh, it gets really, really complicated. Uh, so we're going to make it really, really simple. Uh, endocrinology is just the study of the endocrine system, and the endocrine system is any system that will secrete a hormone into the blood supply to communicate with other organs. So when, a, when an organ secretes a substance into the blood supply to communicate with other organs, that's considered an endocrine system. Your body has countless endocrine systems. Uh, some of them we've already talked about, like the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. That's really an endocrine system, but we don't cover that in endocrinology. We cover that in high blood pressure. And so, as we go through the endocrine system, I want you to keep something in mind uh, to make all of this simple. Endocrinology is just quite simply the regulation of growth metabolism, growth and metabolism, growth energy and metabolism, and balancing growth energy and metabolism with sugar, salt, and water. And so as we go through all the complexities of endocrinology, remember we're just talking about growth and energy and metabolism and balancing all that with sugar, salt, and water. If you recall from excitable membranes, <coughs> excitable membranes like neurons and cardiac conduction, any kind of um, excitable membrane, muscles, uh, myocardium, neurons, they all require very careful solutions of electrolytes and balancing that with sugar, uh, glucose. And so as we go through this, we're going to talk about regulating glucose, sodium, potassium, calcium, all those things require very careful control. And that's where the word neuroendocrine comes from. And most endocrinology courses start with neuroendocrinology, uh, but we're gonna move away from that and start with something uh, very common, especially here in the islands. We're gonna talk about diabetes mellitus. Again, this is part of endocrinology uh, because we're discussing glucose and glucose regulation and how that uh, relates to energy and growth. So let's talk about diabetes mellitus. I'll tell you right now, as we go through this, we'll talk about a diabetes called diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is not a disorder of glucose regulation. Diabetes insipidus is a disorder of water regulation. Diabetes mellitus is the disorder of glucose regulation. And so when we have patients with diabetes mellitus, oh, well, that's the normal diabetes that we know about. There's a type of diabetes out there that has nothing to do with a disorder of glucose regulation, and that's diabetes insipidus. And I wanted to put that out there now so there's not a lot of confusion uh, in the future, especially when these things become a life and death matter. So again, diabetes mellitus is a disorder of glucose regulation. The star of the show is the pancreas. The pancreas sits retroperitoneally above the, uh, right behind the stomach and is involved in not only exocrine function uh, for digestion, but endocrine function for glucose regulation as well. So when we talk about endocrinology, we're gonna notice that these organs have multiple functions all in one anatomic location. Uh, the organs get their name because of their anatomic location, but if you look inside of them very carefully, you'll notice that these organs can do several things at once. And so I think of it this way, there's this big building where my dentist works. And so I, I always point at that, and my kids think of that as the dentist's building, uh, but it doesn't really belong to the dentist. And if you walk in, you'll notice that there's all sorts of other things going on inside of that building besides uh, the dentist. And so we can think of these endocrine organs like, uh, like office buildings, and they all might be, everything going on might have relationship to each other, but uh, you can consider the endocrine organs to really be several organs uh, all in one. And the pancreas is a great place to start. Uh, so the pancreas has endocrine function. 
And that endocrine function that we'll talk about today is insulin and glucagon. Those are the two main hormones that we'll talk about uh, with endocrine regulation. If you read carefully, uh, the pancreas has some other endocrine things going on. But we're going to focus on insulin and glucagon. I'll tell you right now, insulin and glucagon are going to have opposite effects on the regulation of glucose. The pancreas also has a digestive function, and that's exocrine. And so something that's exocrine will secrete something into a tube, and then that substance that passes through the tube will work on whatever's on the other side of that tube. That's the exocrine function of the pancreas. It is a digestive function. And that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about the endocrine function of the pancreas, something the pancreas does for uh, as part of the endocrine system is to secrete insulin and glucagon into the systemic blood supply and supply all the cells uh, with hormones of glucose regulation. Uh, your endothelial lining inside of your arteries does not require these uh, hormones to regulate glucose, nor does your brain. But all the other cells uh, require insulin and glucagon to regulate blood glucose. All right, so here's a cartoon of a pancreas, and if we take a microscopic slide, uh, we'll see these little islands, and these little islands are called islets. And so sometimes if you read the pharmacology, uh, you'll read about islet cells when we're talking about diabetes mellitus, and those islets are from islets of Langerhans, or maybe you'll read about Langerhans cells. They're all the same, the islet cells, the, islet, the Langerhans cells, the islets of Langerhans uh, have cells in them uh, that are involved in endocrine regulation. And the main ones that we're going to talk about are the alpha cells and the beta cells. And if you read carefully, there's theta cells with somatomedin. That gets really interesting and complicated, uh, but that's not really part of normal clinical pharmacology. Normal clinical pharmacology, uh, we're going to talk about islet cells uh, that make glucagon and insulin. So the beta cells make the insulin, and this is going to be a signal. This is a signal that tells the cells to absorb glucose. The alpha cells make glucagon, and they do exactly the opposite. They're going to signal cells to release glucose into the bloodstream. And so I bring this up because as you read, you'll read about islet cells, you'll read about beta cells, you'll read about Langerhand beta cells, and they're talking about cells that make insulin. Or maybe you'll read about islet cells, or Langerhans cells, or alpha cells, or any of that combination. And they make glucagon. So that's why we bring it up, because there's lots of terminology uh, that says exactly the same thing, and, and we've talked about that before. All right, your brain requires the body to regulate glucose, and you can put endothelial cells as well. Uh, but every other cell in the body uh, requires insulin as the key to unlock the glucose door. And so one thing that we're going to notice is the brain does not tolerate really high or really low levels of glucose because the brain relies on the body to regulate blood glucose. And so anyway, here insulin is regulating glucose transport. Uh, later on, I want you to remember that it's the sodium force that drives glucose into the cell or across the cell membrane. And so when we start talking about sodium glucose co-transport, keep in mind this right here. Uh, but what I want you to see right now is this. Uh, glucose is too big to get across the phospholipid bilayer, and so it requires some kind of facilitated transport. The force that drives that is that sodium force that we created with a sodium-potassium pump, and we've talked about that in our uh, cell phys lecture, and we talked about that again when we talked about excitable membranes in neurotransmission as well as cardiac conduction. And so here glucose wants to get across the cell membrane through this uh, facilitating transport protein. And notice that it requires insulin. Insulin is like that key that unlocks the door uh, that allows glucose into the cell. So something to keep in mind that's an important point is people who either cannot make insulin, 
like a diabetic type 1, or maybe they make insulin, but this receptor uh, is resistant to insulin. It doesn't accept the insulin. Uh, the key doesn't fit in the lock, and that's called insulin resistance. And notice that we have a buildup of glucose outside of the cell, and so that might show up on a blood test as elevated glucose. But I want you to keep in mind that the, if there's a defect either in the level of insulin or the receptor that senses that insulin, even though we have really high glucose levels outside of the cell, inside of the cell, the cell is starving. And that's a difficult concept for people to understand when we di deal with diabetes mellitus. They think, oh, well, they have these elevated blood glucose levels, and we can take that blood glucose and turn it into fat and triglycerides. However, failure of this insulin to unlock the door, whether there's not enough insulin or there's resistance to insulin at the receptor, uh, results in starvation inside of the cell. And when the inside of the cell doesn't have what it needs to operate its metabolism properly, it will start to liberate other things, acids and ketones. And so that's where this comes from. And so keep in mind, even though a diabetic might be gaining weight, and might have high glucose levels uh, if this system is not functioning. The insides of the cells are sending off starvation signals, and one of those signals is ketones. So we need this to function properly uh, for the body to function properly. I think we've made this point. Uh, the brain requires glucose. A uh, normal resting brain, I think, takes up 20% of the energy consumption of the body, uh, depending on what the brain is doing. Nearly every cell can make its own supply of energy when glucose is unavailable. Well, the brain cannot. So again, the brain requires the body to regulate glucose, and the main star of the show when we talk about glucose regulation will be the pancreas because it secretes insulin, which is the key that unlocks the glucose door, allowing glucose into the cell. And then glucagon is the signal telling the cells to release some of their stored glucose with the rest of the body. Uh, and the main reason for that is so the brain always has a perfect level of glucose so it can function. But other things that will, other organs that we'll talk about during glucose regulation is especially the liver, the muscles, and the fat they are able to store and release glucose as well. So when we read about drugs that regulate glucose regulation, when we read about medications for diabetics, we'll read a lot about drugs that affect the pancreas, uh, but don't be surprised we come across medications that affect the liver, the muscles, and the fat cells as well. All right, uh, again, the liver, the muscles, and the fat, they're able to store glucose when insulin's present, and they release glucose when stimulated by glucagon. I, I think I repeat myself in the slides. I, I think we tried to take care of that this morning. All right, insulin is our anabolic polypeptide hormone. So this is an important concept to make. First, I want you to see that insulin is a polypeptide. It is a chain of amino acids. It's a short chain. Uh, we can call an oligopeptide. And uh, what I want you to know about insulin being a polypeptide hormone, later on we'll talk about different types of insulins. We'll talk about rapid-acting insulins. We'll talk about long and ultra-long acting insulins. And what we do to form those drugs is to take, to form those medications, we'll take normal insulin and we'll make an adjustment. We'll change one of the peptide we'll change one of the peptides, one of the amino acids in the sequence, and it will change the body's uh, metabolism of that insulin. So it will change uh, how the insulin affects the body and how the body metabolizes the insulin. So that's what a, a point I want to make early. Is insulin is a polypeptide hormone. It's a chain of amino acids that your body uses as a hormone. Anabolic means to put things together. I know they talk about anabolic steroids on TV and in the media. However, from a medical point of view, anabolic is a process 
where we take things and put them together uh, like to polymerize. When we take things, we take separate things and we put them together in chains, that's technically an anabolic process. And so insulin is an anabolic polypeptide hormone. That means that when the cells are exposed to the insulin and the receptor accepts the insulin, that signals not only glucose to come into the cell, but it signals other anabolic processes as well, taking pieces and putting them together, like taking glucose and putting them into chains and taking the glucose and storing that as fat. Those are all anabolic processes. And again, the presence of serum glucose after eating is what stimulates the insulin to be released from the pancreas. And again, they're produced by the beta cells in the pancreas. I don't really need you to know that other than if you read the books, they'll talk about beta cells and islet cells and Langerhans cells, and they all make insulin. Uh, but not only does insulin facilitate glucose into the cell. It also facilitates the storage of carbohydrates, fats, protein in the cells, as well as potassium. And that's an important thing to remember. Potassium is an intracellular electrolyte. It lives inside of the cells. And we saw that with the sodium potassium pump. Cells have these sodium potassium pumps. Living cells have these sodium potassium pumps that push sodium outside and keep potassium inside. And so after we eat something and we grind up all the intracellular stuff into our gut, we get this rush of potassium into the body and insulin helps drive that potassium into the cell as well. There we go. So insulin also augments the transport of potassium into the cells. And so we think about insulin as being the key that unlocks the glucose door, but also facilitates all sorts of anabolic processes, making carbohydrates, uh, making fats, uh, bringing proteins and amino acids into the cell, and driving potassium into the cell as well. And so this is an important point I wanted to make when we talk about when we use insulin as a medication as for a diabetic, that's involved in glucose regulation. We'll look for glucose levels to determine the correct amount of insulin. However, if you're in a critical care unit, taking care of a cardiac patient may be there in ventricular fibrillation because of really high potassium levels, or maybe they have some kind of arrhythmia because of high potassium levels. Maybe you'll see insulin used as a drug in an emergency situation for this right here to help deal with hyperkalemia using that insulin to drive the potassium back into the cells. And so when we talk about insulin as a drug, as a medication, 99% uh, of the time we're talking about a diabetic. Uh, however, someone with diabetes mellitus, however, keep in mind that we will use a rapid acting insulin in a critical situation uh, where somebody has really high potassium levels. So don't be surprised if you see that. Even if the patient's not diabetic, if they have hyperkalemia and it's resulting in uh, lethal arrhythmias, lethal dysrhythmias, uh, we might see insulin being used uh, to force potassium into the cells. And so as we think about, pota as we think about insulin, I want you to remember that not only does it facilitate glucose going into the cells, uh, but it also facilitates turning glucose into carbohydrates and fats uh, and driving proteins into the cell as well as potassium. All right, well, we can take all of that and uh, think of the opposite, glucagon. It's a polypeptide hormone as well. However, it's catabolic. Catabolic means to take things and break them down into their individual parts. And so glucagon is catabolic because it tells the cells to take their storage of glucose, which might be in chains in the form of carbohydrates, might be in the form of fats, uh, and it tells the body to turn those parts, break them down into individual glucose molecules, and put them into the blood. Again, so we can maintain a proper glucose level for not only the rest of the cells, but especially the brain, because the brain relies on the body to regulate glucose.
uh, glucagons made by the alpha cells in the pancreas. I have a hard time remembering which ones are the beta cells and which ones are the alpha cells, but I only bring that up again because the books will talk about alpha cells, alpha Langerhans cells, or the alpha islet cells, and they make glucagon. And it does what insulin does, exactly the opposite. It facilitates the release of carbohydrates and fats and proteins and other nutrients from the cells, especially the liver, especially the muscles, especially the fat. Those are our major storage organs. Your muscles have all sorts of nutrients stored up for those big, long emergency runs. Um, and so uh, as well as the fat, the fat is obviously a storage for uh, uh, calories, um, and then the liver is also a major storage for these things, and so glucagon will facilitate the release of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins from the cells. So when insulin levels get low, uh, as in exercise or starvation, or the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, glucagon will be released. And so I challenge you now to look at what is the uh, drug of choice for beta blocker overdose uh, when this system is being blocked, the sympathetic nervous system is being blocked uh, for whatever reason, uh, glucagon will be the drug uh, to give the body to help it uh, overcome uh, blockage of the sympathetic nervous system like beta blocker overdose. And so keep that in mind as we move forward. Gluco, glucose, neo as a new genesis to form in the beginning. And so gluconeogenesis is the process of forming glucose from amino acids uh, as well as some other substances. And so glucagon stimulates gluconeogenesis. And so this is important to realize that we'll take our amino acids and break them down to facilitate glucose formation and so if you see uh, starving children uh, from in uh, third world countries and they look like they have these big tummies that's not because they're fat that's because of starvation and what's happening is their abdominal contents are protruding uh, from their abdomen quite simply because the muscle uh, of the abdominal wall is being broken down because those amino acids are being taken away from the muscles and turned into glucose. And so this is something I want you to keep your eye on when you're looking at uh, starving children in Africa and you see their big tummies. Uh, that is their, 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 their bowels uh, pushing through the abdominal wall because the abdominal wall has become so thin uh, from breaking down muscle and turning that into amino acids. And that's due to glucagon uh, stimulating gluconeogenesis. And the two major, pla uh, the major place that your body will take the, amino the muscles to turn into the amino acids so then they can turn that into glucose is heart muscle and uh, uh, especially heart muscle. And so you'll see people who if they starve themselves long enough, they'll have heart failure. And so I wanted you to be aware of this because there's all sorts of interesting things that we can talk about when we talk about glu a glucagon because as professional healthcare workers, uh, we think of insulin as the star of the show when we talk about diabetes mellitus. Uh, but I want you to be aware of a glucagon and its, uh, its effect on the body. All right, diabetes mellitus is quite simply a chronic failure of glucose regulation. So chronic means long time over time. It takes about 10 years of glucose dysregulation to result in all of the problems that we're going to talk about. But acute failures are right now. Uh, when a patient is hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic right now, our main concern is their neurologic health. And so acute failures in glucose regulation can result in neurologic compromise from confusion to coma, even brain death. If we get, if a patient's blood glucose level gets below 20, below 10, 
uh, we're going to look at coma and brain death if we don't see that, if we don't reverse that very quickly. And then we can have the same thing in the opposite direction, depending on how chronic they are. However, once a blood glucose level gets in the 600, 800,000 level, we're going to see coma and brain death if we don't uh, take care of that slowly. And so there are some interesting things to realize, especially uh, the osmotic regulation of fluids in the central nervous system when we're uh, trying to deal with high and low blood glucose levels. However, what I want you to see from this is acute failures in glucose regulation will result in neurologic compromise from confusion, uh, to coma, and even brain death. And so when we see people whose blood glucose levels get really high or really low, uh, one of the first things we worry about is this right here. However, it depends on how long uh, they've had high glucose levels. If they've had it, if this has been going on for a long time, the longer it's been going on, uh, the more gently we have to bring the glucose levels down. And someday we'll put that in your notes. All right, well, diabetes mellitus is due to a chronic failure of glucose regulation. And chronic failures in glucose regulation result in vascular disease. Uh, atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis are both, uh, uh, both resultants of chronic glucose dysregulation. Sometimes we'll see this as poor wound healing, uh, especially the bottom of the foot. If you know a diabetic, uh, they are very... Uh, they need to be very aware of the need for uh, wound care on their feet. And part of the reason for the poor wound healing is the neuropathy, the nerve damage that they suffer. Uh, diabetic, uh, somebody with diabetes mellitus for uh, over, for many years, uh, they have neuropathy. They don't have the same sensation and so they lose sensation. When they lose sensation on the bottom of their feet, they can't feel pain. And then if they can't feel pain, then it's going to be harder for that wound to heal if they keep stepping on it, exacerbating it. The other thing that's very important to know as we talk about neuropathy is keep in mind that all this time we've been talking about atherosclerosis causing stroke and heart attack. And when we talk about heart attacks, uh, we think of severe chest pain clutching the chest. And that's fine in normal people. Uh, but people who are diabetic and they have neuropathy, they have nerve damage, they can't sense, uh, they don't have the same sensation that a normal person does, uh, they will not be able to feel that crushing chest pain in their chest. And so maybe somebody who is diabetic with their neuropathy, when they're having a myocardial infarction, which they're at very high risk for, Maybe they won't have that crushing chest pain. Maybe it'll be very mild symptoms, even though there's severe disease going on in the chest for this reason right here. So when we talk about neuropathy and diabetes mellitus, we're usually talking about uh, poor sensation in the feet, one of the first signs of the complications of diabetes mellitus is a loss of sensation on the bottom of the feet. Uh, diabetes mellitus uh, results in nephropathy, kidney disease, quite simply because of uh, vascular compromise, uh, arteriosclerosis in the small vessels of the kidneys. And so, again, uh, all these things are problems that we have if we're not carefully regulating glucose. This leads to atherosclerosis, clogging of the arteries. We talked about that with stroke and myocardial infarction. And it, because of small de vessel disease, um, diabetes mellitus results in blindness, uh, damage to the retina. So that's why it's very difficult to get people to be compliant with diabetes mellitus because they'll go to the doctor and they'll feel fine. Maybe they have some cut on their arm or maybe they have some place that's not healing so well. Another thing, another uh, evidence that we look for is uh, chronic infection, especially chronic fungal infections, yeast infections. We'll treat them, they go away, they come back. These recurrent yeast infections, these uh, recurrent uh, dermatophyte infections can be a sign of diabetes mellitus. And so maybe they come into the, maybe they come into the doctor's office with a rash and uh, 
uh, we do some testing and we realize they're diabetic and now we want them to see the eye doctor to make sure this is not going on and there's all sorts of testing that we're going to want to do and then all sorts of diet and exercise and medications that they're going to need dietary counseling and medications to carefully regulate their blood glucose and it's really difficult to get people to be compliant with better diet and better exercise and their medications uh, quite simply because they don't really notice any symptoms from the problems until it's too late. Uh, Native, of Ho uh, Native Hawaiians have the highest diabetes mortality rates uh, when compared to other major groups. Uh, morbidity uh, means really bad and mortality means death and um, Native Hawaiians have the highest diabetes problems when compared to any other ma major ethnic groups uh, and this slide says whites have the lowest diabetes mortality rates. I can assure you there is plenty of diabetes mellitus causing all sorts of morbidity and mortality in Native Hawaiians, African Americans, whites, Asian, Asian Pacific, Hispanics, there is a lot of diabetes mellitus out there. And so we want the Native Hawaiian population and our Pacific Islanders to know that they have the highest diabetes mortality rates. Uh, but I want everyone else to know that we have really high diabetes mortality rates. Uh, instead of that, have the highest diabetes mortality rates when compared to other major ethnic groups. Uh, whites still have very high diabetes mortality rates. That's what that should say. Whites have very high diabetes mortality rates, and so does everyone else. So as we go through the, as we talk about diabetes mellitus, we're going to divide diabetes mellitus into type 1 and type 2. I'll tell you right now, type 2 is the most common type of diabetes mellitus. And so when we're talking about diabetes mellitus in the community, the kind we can control with diet and exercise, we're talking about this right here, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, this is the most common type. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more type 1 diabetes mellitus. So let's start with type 1 diabetes mellitus. A type 1 diabetic does not make insulin. They have to have insulin. This is not the type of diabetes that they're going to be able to exclusively manage with diet and exercise. If they are not making enough insulin, they have to be given insulin. And so we'll see type 1 referred to as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Now, a problem that we have when communicating is that sometimes we will put a type 2 diabetic on insulin. That's fine. That does not make them insulin dependent. And I've had that argument with the uh, case manager at countless insurance companies that just because a type 2 diabetic is on insulin, that doesn't make them an insulin dependent diabetic. So type 1s are insulin dependent because they do not make insulin. If you read the older stuff, we used to call this juvenile onset because we usually saw this in kids. Uh, it's more common to see this in children than adults. However, more and more we're seeing uh, more type 1 diabetes in adults. And so we don't really call it juvenile onset so much anymore. So we'll go through an when we talk about insulin, we'll talk about managing type 1 diabetes because type 1 diabetes is managed with insulin. Sure, diet and exercise are important, but a type 1 diabetic is managed with insulin. All right, well, type 2 diabetes is a defect with the insulin receptors. And early in this lecture, we talked about insulin being the key that unlocks the glucose door and we have two problems. Either there aren't enough keys, there's not enough insulin, as in type 1, or there's something wrong with the lock that doesn't accept the insulin. And this is our problem with type 2 diabetes. There's a, a defect with the insulin receptors. Now you'll see type 2 diabetes where they don't make enough insulin as well, uh, but type 2 diabetes we refer to as insulin resistance. Uh, there's a defect with the insulin receptors, and so you'll see type 2 diabetes referred to as insulin-resistant 
uh, diabetes mellitus. In the old days, we called this adult onset. However, we're seeing more and more children with type 2 diabetes, and that is probably due to lack of exercise and poor diet. Uh, again, type 2 diabetes is referred to as non-insulin dependent diabetes. Uh, we don't really like these terms so much, uh, but they continue to pop up, especially in the billing software. And so I wanted you to be very careful, especially those of you who are uh, responsible for communicating this information with third-party payers. Uh, there is a difference between insulin and non-insulin diabetes mellitus, and it has to do with whether they're making insulin or their insulin receptors are resistant to the insulin. I think I've made that point. How are we going to diagnose diabetes mellitus? All right, well, we'll start at the bottom. A hemoglobin A1c greater than 7 is a great screening tool. Uh, when I was in practice a long time ago, the insurers used to tell me that we could not use hemoglobin A1c as a screening tool. Uh, we had to do all the stuff that's above, but now, uh, hemoglobin A1c is common enough that hemoglobin A1c greater than 7 is diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus and, in my opinion, uh, probably the best diagnostic criteria. Starting at the top, uh, maybe they have an elevated fasting blood glucose. Fasting means not eating for 8 hours before the test. Look, if you eat a bunch of food and then check your blood glucose, it's going to be high. That's the way it's supposed to work. So when we check blood glucose levels, they need to be fasting. And later on, we'll talk about checking blood glucose before meals and at bedtime. That doesn't mean four times a day. That means before meals, when they're hungry. And so when we're checking an elevated, or when we're checking a fasting blood glucose, that means they haven't eaten eight hours before the test. And here the slide says 126. Uh, you'll hear all sorts of clinicians I describe all sorts of different numbers to stick in that slide, uh, and that's fine. Elevated triglycerides greater than 150 can be an initial diagnostic criteria. This is something that I've uh, had many discussions with, with many case managers, about elevated triglycerides sometimes being the first thing that we see in a diabetic. I've had several cases where somebody develops diabetes mellitus and the first thing that's elevated is their triglycerides. Maybe their hemoglobin A1c is somewhere around 6 and everything else looks okay, but their triglycerides are starting to go up. And sometimes an elevated triglyceride is the first thing we'll see in somebody with diabetes mellitus. We talked a lot about managing triglycerides in our 2.5 lecture. And if somebody has familial hypertriglyceridemia, then those medications make sense in those situations. However, with diabetic hypertriglyceridemia, we have to manage their blood glucose. We're going to manage a diabetic's triglycerides, their elevated triglycerides, not through the medications that we talked about in 2.5. We need to manage those triglycerides using, uh, with managing glucose. Getting their hemoglobin A1c less than 7 will take care of the triglycerides. And so in my clinical practice, never seen uh, medication for hypertriglyceridemia work better than managing their glucose. Anyone who's pregnant gets a glucose tolerance test. What we do is we get a baseline blood glucose and then we give them uh, this really syrupy sweet drink uh, to shoot their glucose levels up and if their blood glucose levels go up uh, much higher than what's on this slide, higher than 200, uh, then we think that they have diabetes mellitus. And so uh, I definitely wanted to point out elevated triglycerides because I think we miss that a lot in diagnostic criteria. Uh, but what I want you guys to know is about, what I want you to know about is a hemoglobin A1C. So hemoglobin is the stuff that makes uh, your blood red when it's carrying oxygen and blue when it's carrying carbon dioxide. And hemoglobin A1C will collect glucose, the hemoglobin will collect glucose molecules as it floats through the bloodstream over the course of four months. And so if the glucose levels have been really high, uh, 
they'll stick to the hemoglobin more and more, and we'll see that as an A1C. And so hemoglobin A1C basically gives us the average glucose level over the last four months. Again, if the level is higher than 7, if the hemoglobin A1C is higher than 7, that tells us that their blood glucose has been running too high over the last four months. If we can keep their hemoglobin A1C less than 7, that's pretty good. If we can keep it less than 5, that's perfect. So even if we come across a patient who has uh, bouts of hyperglycemia, as long as their hemoglobin A1C is less than 7 or even less than 6, then we think that we believe that they're being well managed. So the hemoglobin A1C again reveals the overall glucose control for the past 120 days or four months. And so I think it's on my slide. Oh, hemoglobin A1C of less than seven is an initial starting point. That's what we want to see. If we can keep it at five, that is perfect. And so again, if you have a diabetic who's maintaining their hemoglobin A1C levels in between five and six, then that's very well managed. And so even if they have hyperglycemic, episodes, we looked at hemoglobin A1C as the overall, uh, man, uh, the overall indicator of quality of glucose control. All right, well maybe they'll have symptoms before we test them, and so polyuria, excessive urination, polydipsia, excessive thirst, and polyphagia, uh, and that's spelled with a G. Uh, polyphagia, excessive hunger. All right, when we, when, we, when we talked about the kidneys, we talked about the glomerulus uh, uh, release, um, filtering filtrate into Bowman's capsule and the collection system. And so when high levels of glucose end up in the urine, then that, that glucose acts as an osmotic diuretic. When we put glucose, when the kidneys, when high levels of glucose result in high levels of glucose in the urine, that glucose absorbs water, expanding urine volume. And so glucose is an osmotic diuretic. And so high glucose levels result in excessive urination. That's better. So high glucose levels result in um, excessive urination because glucose, again, is an osmotic diuretic expanding urine volume. All right, well, losing this free water through the kidneys results in an overall dehydration state in the body, a hyperosmolar state, which the brain can sense, and that lack of free water compared to the solutes tells the brain that we're not getting enough water, and that's where this excessive thirst comes from, the polydipsia. And again, uh, polyphagia ex is excessive hunger. Remember, even though there are, there's glucose outside of the cell, there's high blood glucose levels in the bloodstream, uh, the inside of the cells are starving, and they're sending out starvation signals, and the brain can sense that, and so that's where this excessive hunger comes from. And so when we see polydipsia, polyuria, that's where the word diabetes came from. Uh, maybe they'll have nonspecific symptoms like uh, fatigue or lethargy is sleepiness. A recurrent infection uh, is something that can be a red flag for diabetes mellitus. Uh, prolonged wound healing, seizure, coma. A diabetic ketoacidosis, I have a great slides on those, maybe they'll try to get to those this week. A diabetic ketoacidosis uh, is uh, a very uh, severe form of diabetes. What happens, the inside of the cells are starving and they start to release these ketones and that causes a severe acid-base disturbance in the body. By the time we see somebody with DKA, they've lost so much free water through their kidneys through osmotic diuresis that they're severely dehydrated as well. And so maybe we'll all get to the DKA slides this week. 
Again, the complications of diabetes mellitus are the same as smoking and high blood pressure and high cholesterol results in atherosclerosis. And so when you know somebody who smokes and has high cholesterol and high triglycerides and high blood pressure and they're diabetic, these things multiply to result in disaster. And I was talking about to a group uh, not too long ago and a point was that you know when somebody suffers the ravages of this uh, they pass away and it's really hard to get people who've passed away to come back and say look it's really important for you to manage your diabetes because very bad things can happen this can result in death and lethality and so there's plenty of people who are around who are still surviving this that have all sorts of opinions but we never seem to hear from the people who have passed because of this and those numbers are quite large and so it's very difficult to get people to manage their diabetes uh, mostly because most of the diabetics you know, the diabetics we know are, are still alive telling their stories and if only the people who have died from diabetes mellitus could tell their stories maybe it would impact the public to be a little bit more compliant or a lot more compliant with their management of diabetes mellitus because diabetes mellitus uh, results in all the same things that we talked about with high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Atherosclerosis resulting in stroke, uh, hemorrhage of the brain, uh, stroke with or without hemorrhage, blindness, heart attack, kidney failure, um, and so diabetes mellitus is one of the top reasons people need, di uh, need uh, dialysis. Uh, diabetes mellitus is one of the top reasons for people to have amputations because small vessel disease in their feet uh, results in necrosis of their feet and their extremities and it turns, it's really, really difficult uh, to take care of those people. Uh, because it's, it's very sad to see this happen and so that's why it's so important uh, to manage diabetes mellitus. Uh, many times we see it as poor wound healing on the feet and again because they have poor vessel, uh, poor uh, blood supply, they have poor vascular disease, uh, it makes wound healing take a lot longer and then they have neuropathy on the bottom of their feet as well so they can't feel the wound and they'll step on it and make it worse uh, but keep in mind that neuropathy also interferes with them being able to feel chest pain and so we think of myocardial infarctions having this crushing chest pain and, and we see that plenty uh, but with a diabetic they won't necessarily have crushing chest pain uh, because they have neuropathy and so maybe they feel a little indigestion uh, maybe by the time they have symptoms of a myocardial infarction it's too late All right, so eventually we're going to talk about the treatment for type 2 diabetes, which is probably the most important thing we can teach our population. But for a pharmacology class, we're going to start with insulin, talk about type 1 diabetes management through insulin. Uh, again, we can use insulin for a type 2 diabetic, uh, but we talk about insulin in a type 1 diabetic because these people do not make insulin. And notice the most important treatment for a diabetic with type 1 is insulin. Yeah, diet and exercise is important, uh, but uh, insulin uh, and glucose regulation are the most important things that we can do for a type 1 diabetic. All right, so how and when do we give insulin? There's all sorts of different insulins out there and all sorts of different schedules, and it's kind of confusing how to start insulin with a patient on an outpatient basis. Um, one of the first things they told us is managing glucose is like flying an airplane. It is better to be too high than to too, be too low. Uh, airplane hits the ground, uh, the flight is over. Same thing with diabetes. You get their glucose levels down to zero, uh, you've essentially crashed their brain. And so the most important thing that we can do is not over treat it initially. The other thing to keep in mind is that as blood glucose levels get really high and increasing the osmolality, osmolarity of the blood, 
the brain responds by making its own osmoles, uh, idiogenic osmoles. And so the brain's osmolarity is also high as well to match that. And when we severely, when we rapidly change their glucose levels, uh, we change uh, the osm osmotic environment of the brain and we risk cerebral edema if we drop glucose levels in somebody who's been a diabetic uh, with high glucose levels for a long time. So one of the most important things we can remember with giving insulin therapy, whether they're in DKA, especially when they're in DKA or any diabetic, is to start gently. Stay away from zero and don't worry about it being too high unless they're really having a lot of neurologic compromise. But again, slow and gentle is how we want to start. Oh yeah, and then this, what's on the slide? Well, that depends on their ability to be compliant. And so whether we use complex monitors and pumps that we can control with our cell phone or we do things the old-fashioned way, that just depends on their ability to be compliant. And so that's something to keep in mind as we decide how to take care of a diabetic and when to give them insulin. All right, well, the simplest thing we can do is give them a long-acting insulin, and we'll talk about the long-acting insulins. Here we have Lantus, a long-acting insulin. Maybe that's the simplest thing they can do, is take a daily dose of Lantus in the evening. Or maybe they can take a twice-a-day dose of an intermediate-acting insulin. Uh, we're seeing that less and less because we're seeing more of this. We're seeing single doses of long and even ultra-long acting insulins uh, being the management of choice. Uh, we're seeing less of this. We used to see this a while ago, uh, but I don't see this as much anymore. To make things complicated, uh, maybe we can add a sliding scale with using a regular or a rapid acting insulin, and we'll talk about what that means. Here, see it says AC before meals and HS at bedtime. So it's important when you're using a sliding scale to check their blood sugar before the meal. If you check their blood sugar after the meal, that information is not going to be useful to dose the insulin because we their sugar levels, their glucose levels uh, become elevated after uh, they eat. Uh, the most complicated thing we can do is use an insulin pump. And so here's somebody, uh, they have a glucose sensor on one part of their body, and then here's an insulin pump uh, that's delivering insulin subcutaneously. Uh, some people could control this with their cell phone. and uh, this gets really complicated, and this is appropriate for somebody who uh, is able to manage complex information, synthesize complex information, put it together, and take care of themselves. And so if you know a diabetic who uses an insulin pump, uh, maybe they can talk to you about the different types of schedules, and like if they're planning uh, to go out and eat, uh, maybe they'll change uh, the way they dose. And so that's something interesting. Uh, for another discussion. If you know somebody with an insulin pump, you should ask them to talk to you about it because it's actually very fascinating uh, the things that we can do now with an insulin pump. All right, in the ancient times, uh, we would go to the uh, animal uh, slaughterhouses and collect their pancreases, if pancreases is the plural of pancreas, and uh, we would take them and squish them up and get the insulin from them. Well, we don't do that anymore. Now we use genetic engineering to modify a yeast or any kind of bacteria, any kind of organism, uh, because these little organisms like e yeast and E. coli, a lot of microscopic creatures, and we'll talk about this when we start talking about antimicrobial agents, these little microscopic, uh, cre these little uh, bacteria well, they make all sorts of antibiotics to fight off their, uh, fight off people, uh, fight off other organisms encroaching on them. And so they secrete things called polyketides naturally uh, to fight off the things that are growing in around them. And some of these creatures are able to get that information, some of these bacteria are able to get this information from other bacteria uh, through something called a plasmid. 
And so bacteria and yeast are really good at taking genetic information from another organism and then incorporating it in themselves so they can synthesize a new substance. And so this is a self-protective feature of certain yeast and certain bacteria. And we can manipulate that to make things, to get those, get those bacteria to make uh, all sorts of different substances like insulin. And so today we can give the genetic code to a bacteria and that bacteria will make a perfect replication of human insulin, identical to human insulin. And so today when we talk about genetically modified organisms, uh, we're talking about when we're talking about these organisms that can make an exact replica of human insulin. And so that's going to be regular insulin. That's going to be our short-acting insulin. Our regular insulin is going to be identical to human insulin. But again, insulin is a polypeptide hormone. And we've learned by changing the sequence of amino acids, we can change a, the sequence in one or two places and change how the insulin works, whether it's rapid or short or intermediate or long-acting. And so that's what we're going to see as we talk about the insulins. Oh, there we go. All right, uh, rapid acting, uh, RA, rapid acting, short acting, intermediate, act, intermediate acting, and long acting are the most common types of insulins that we'll talk about. Uh, now today, when the most common insulins used to manage a diabetic are long and even ultra long acting, we can put them together. And then rapid acting, we're seeing less short acting and intermediate acting insulins being used. We're also seeing less mixtures being used as well. Uh, so I definitely want you to focus on the rapid acting insulins, the long acting insulins, and some of the newer ultra long acting insulins. And we're going to lump ultra long and long together uh, to make things a little simpler for these slides. All right, I heard somebody arguing with these numbers one day, and something I want you to know is that when insulin is being tested by the manufacturer, when a new form of insulin is being tested by the manufacturer, they're going to come up with a certain set of numbers that they need to get the drug approved by the FDA. But then once the drug is in use through clinical practice, when the practitioners get together, they report their data, and we'll notice that the numbers are a little bit different. And so these aren't exact numbers. Uh, they're rounded to be close enough for you to remember. And so if you read anywhere about rapid-acting insulins, uh, I doubt they will tell you that it's exactly 15 to 30 minutes. Maybe it's 14 to 31 or 16 to 35 or something like that. So I don't want you to take these numbers as being these fixed, uh, well, uh, these perfect numbers because they're not. And so you do want to know that rapid acting insulins work rapidly uh, as soon as that dose is given. We expect them to work anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. And then they're going to peak from 30 minutes to an hour and a half and by three to four hours that dose has worn off. And so I think this is an important set of numbers to learn. Uh, 15 minutes to work, peaking at 30 minutes, uh, being done at three hours. That first set of numbers is what I would memorize if I were you. 15 minutes onset, peaks at 30 minutes, last three hours. I think that's fine. Uh, and then if you can remember the other set of numbers, even better. Uh, insulin, Aspart, Novolog, and Lispro, Humalog. And these little names come from like um, these come from the names of the amino acids that are substituted in normal insulin to make them rapid acting. Uh, Novolog and Humalog are the uh, most widely prescribed form of insulins. Uh, and Epidra is still on the market, uh, but these are rapid acting insulins. Uh, the regular acting insulins is how normal human insulin works. Uh, its onset is going to be half an hour, peak at two hours, last three to six hours. Right. Uh, and we'll see <coughs> uh, insulin regular is what will be called humulin, as in humulin, as in human, uh, recombinant. That's what the R officially stands for. Uh, they say this R stands for recombinant, uh, but I can assure you that R stands for regular. And so when you see that R, that's, that, 
that means regular. So the R insulins are regular insulins. But we're seeing this less uh, and because uh, the rapid acting insulins, because they're rapid acting, you know, we can get finer control with the rapid acting insulins, especially with sliding scales and insulin pumps. So we're seeing less short acting insulins uh, being used. Uh, we're seeing less intermediate acting insulins being used as well. Uh, and you can see the numbers there. They take a little while to work, uh, peaking from 6 to 12 hours. And so humulin N, intermediate acting insulin, I'm convinced that's what that N stands for. Uh, insulin isophane and pH, um, well, these are the intermediate acting insulins. Something to keep in mind is somebody who's being managed by twice a day doses of um, of an intermediate acting insulin, keep in mind that insulin works 12 hours later. And so if somebody's managing themselves with twice a day doses of insulin, and the m dose they give themselves in the morning, because it peaks after 12 hours, that dose they give themselves in the morning affects their evening sugars. And the dose they give themselves in the evening affects their morning sugars. That's one of the reasons that we're seeing less of this being used, because there's a lot of confusion, because the dose that, the intermediate dose that's given in the morning affects the evening sugars. So if the evening glucose levels are too high or too low, we're going to adjust the morning dose. And then if the morning glucose levels are too high or too low, we're going to adjust the evening dose with an intermediate acting insulin. And so there are people who do manage themselves with twice a day doses of intermediate acting insulins. And it's important to keep in mind that this peak of 12 hours later is, is something to remember because that evening dose affects the morning glucose and the morning dose of insulin affects the evening glucose levels. And that gets uh, very confusing, not only to explain uh, to patients, but for patients to remember and, and caregivers to remember as well. So we're seeing less and less of the intermediate acting insulins. Uh, what I see, uh, what we see more and more of is long and ultra long acting insulins where they can give themselves a dose usually at night and it will last over for anywhere from 18 to over 24 hours. So here are ultra long acting insulins. Uh, and our long-acting insulins, and we're going to just put them in one category for today. Uh, these are the most common long-acting insulins being prescribed today, Lantus, uh, Levomir, and uh, Traceba, which is considered an ultra-long-acting insulin. Um, if you have the top 200 list, uh, these are on uh, that list as well, and we'll, we'll talk about the top 200 list more later. But I want you to be aware of these right here. This is a little bit different than your notes. What's in your notes is probably what your quiz is going to be about. Uh, but I want you to pencil these things in because this is uh, what's most common. Something that's difficult about this class is that the medications uh, change. They come off on the market and off the market. And the things that I put on my slides, maybe they're not the most common thing a few years later. And so for a pharmacology class, it is rather difficult to try to keep up with what's on the market and what's not on the market, what's on the top 200 list, what's not on the top 200 list. And so that's something I need you guys to do as we go along. And so at the beginning of the semester, uh, hopefully we'll give you a list of very common medications, most commonly prescribed medications. And as we go through the lectures, I want you to find these medications on that list. And we'll talk about that as we go along. All right, let's take a look at a, a, a insulin sliding scale. And um, more commonly, we're seeing rapid acting insulins instead of regular insulins. Uh, so you know what, I'm going to change that now. We're going to use a rapid acting insulin. I'm glad I have a new keyboard. The other day I had a bad keyboard. All right, good. Let's, uh, let's use a rapid acting insulin. Oh, and before we do any of that, let's not run out of time. Good. <laughs> 
All right, now these aren't exact numbers either. I'm sure there are plenty of doctors who do not want to be called when it's greater than 450. I'm sure there's plenty of doctors who want to be called at 300. All right, depends on the patient. Uh, maybe this guy wants to sleep at night, all right. And maybe it's not 200 to 250. Maybe they use a little bit different numbers. Uh, maybe they don't use 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Maybe they're using 3, 6, and 9. Okay. So we just want you to see what an insulin sliding scale looks like. Again, we're going to check their glucose before meals and at bedtime. And according to this sliding scale, if their blood glucose is 200 to 250, we'll give them two units of this rapid-acting insulin. Uh, if their blood glucose is 351 to four, uh, three uh, I'm sorry, 251 to 300, we'll give them four units and so forth. And then there'll be a point where the physician will want to get a phone call uh, to determine uh, what dose of insulin is next. All right, so this is what a sliding scale looks like. And the purpose of the sliding scale, not for you to memorize this one, the purpose of the sliding scale is to realize that every single sliding scale you look at is going to be different. It's going to have to do with uh, risk management of the physician and the individual um, individual characteristics of the patient. Uh, insulin must be injected. We can do it IV or with an insulin syringe, uh, meter dose pin injector. That's what this is. The person here can just dial in the dose that they want. And here they're dialing in 18 units of Lantus and so they don't have to do any calculations when they draw this up. Again, the risks of insulin are its therapeutic extension, hypoglycemia. Uh, we can give them too much insulin to where they become hypoglycemic. All right, in the short time we have left, uh, let's talk about management for diabetes type 2, non-insulin diabetes mellitus. Uh, diet and exercise, we can manage diabetes mellitus with diet and exercise. I've seen plenty of patients that I was convinced could not be managed with diet and exercise, and they were able to diet and exercise their way into complete management of diabetes uh, type 2. And so I do not want to underemphasize uh, the uh, importance of good diet and exercise in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Uh, however, this is a, a, a pharmacology class, so let's talk about uh, the various hypoglycemic agents. Uh, the sulfonylureas are no longer the first drug line drug of choice, and we're seeing these use less. Uh, use less. Uh, however, they're the first on our slides. Uh, and here's some sulfonylureas uh, that are, can be used alone or in combination. Uh, right now, the drug of choice, the number one oral hypoglycemic agent for diabetes mellitus is this right here, metformin glucophage. And this adjusts how the, this affects how the muscles deal with glucose and how the liver deals with glucose. What I want you to know about metformin glucophage is it can cause lactic acidosis and so we have to monitor kidney function uh, before contrast studies and so uh, you might have somebody on metformin glucophage and get a call from the radiologist saying, hey, we need to stop this medication before we can do this certain type of x-ray with iodine contrast. And so we'll check their kidney function, we'll stop the glucophage, we'll do the, uh, we'll, we'll stop the glucophage, we'll check their kidney function, we'll do the test, we'll check their kidney function again, and if all that's okay, we can start glucophage again. We're seeing less of these, the thiazolidinediones. Um, Actos is the one that's still even on the market. Uh, the other one in your notes is only, uh, is seldom used. We're seeing absorption inhibitors, absorption inhibitors uh, used more and more, and these prevent the bowels from absorbing glucose. Uh, Precose and glycet are some absorption inhibitors. Uh, but the management of incretins, the drugs that infect, affect incretins, are what's going on now with modern treatment of not only diabetes, uh, but what's something we call pre-metabolic syndrome. And the incretin drugs are now being investigated as weight loss drugs. And so uh, we need to turn our attention to uh, the incretin uh, drugs uh, and the metabolism of the incretins uh, as, we, as we study advancements in the management of diabetes. So the incretins are gastrointestinal hormones. Uh, this is the way that the 
the uh, stomach signals the pancreas to uh, release insulin. Uh, so one of the first ones, uh, in Cretan mimetic, uh, was exenatide, bieta. It's injectable and it's for type 2 diabetes mellitus. So don't be fooled. Uh, most of the stuff we talk about are oral hypoglycemic agents, but bieta. Exenatide uh, was our first in Cretan mimetic uh, injectable uh, to treat type 2 diabetes mellitus. It enhances glucose-dependent insulin secretion by the pancreatic beta cells and suppressing glucagon secretion, slowing gastric emptying. Again, uh, the incretins come from the stomach to signal the pancreas. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you. Exenatide bieta is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Uh, the incretin mimetics are glu glucagon-like peptide-1 receptor agonists. Uh, and there's a couple of other uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, that come off the top 200 list uh, that I wanted you to be aware of. All right, well, DPP-4, uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4, breaks down the incretins, and so cytogliptin, uh, Genuvia blocks the breakdown of these incretins. So before we're talking about incretin receptor agonists, and now we're talking about blocking the uh, enzyme that breaks down the incretins. And so this is why Genuvia is being used more and more as a oral uh, hypoglycemic agent. By blocking the breakdown of incretins, uh, this increases in cretin levels, which stimulates insulin release. All right, something new and not in your notes are the sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor. If you remember from the beginning of the slide, we used the sodium force to drive glucose into the cell. And so we have these facilitated transport proteins in our kidneys that help us reabsorb glucose from the urine and they're called sodium glucose co-transporters and specifically uh, we're inhibiting type 2 and so by preventing the reabsorption of glucose in the kidneys we can lower our blood glucose levels we can prevent that reabsorption of glucose however the trade-off of that again is glucose is an osmotic diuretic uh, increasing urine volume. And so uh, this is what's, n this is something new going on uh, with uh, the management of diabetes mellitus. By the way, we use ACE inhibitors to protect kidneys from damage caused by diabetes mellitus. And so I want you to be careful about using terminology like uh, antihypertensive to describe ACE inhibitors because therapeutically, uh, that's the easiest way to describe ACE inhibitors, and that's how they're most commonly used. But we will give ACE inhibitors to diabetics even if they don't have high blood pressure for this reason right here, uh, to protect the kidneys from damage caused by diabetes mellitus, that small vessel disease. And sometimes uh, we'll look at microalbumin levels to see that the kidneys are starting to be damaged by diabetes mellitus and that is a good reason to add the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors to the regimen. And we've talked about ACE inhibitors in the antihypertensive section. All right, and what do we want for uh, uh, managing diabetes mellitus? Uh, we want our hemoglobin A1C to be less than 5. Less than 7 is okay. Uh, less than 5 would be perfect and again we want to manage uh, blood pressure and triglycerides uh, as well as cholesterol. All right that being said when we come back uh, we'll talk even more about endocrinology until then aloha.